Hamburg still has a good scene, you know, like a lot of good skaters from Germany come from here with their skate hall too, so during the winter they have a lot of possibilities to skate. It's, you don't have that that often in many German cities, you know. It's more independent, the skateboarding scene and this, uh, the mentality out here, because there's not too many big companies behind it pushing it, you know. People do it out of their hearts, you know. Yeah, so this is, um, this is the upper, up, we call it uptown of, uh, of the shop of Mentis. Here we have all the girls' clothes, the jeans, Trap has a nice clothing line also. It's not something that you really make a lot of money on, you know. In the beginning, as a German board brand, you were not really so accepted because everybody looked more to America because everything was more glossy and the pros were more heroes and stuff. It's not in Thrasher and doesn't have ads and stuff, so it was kind of hard to open the doors in the beginning. Here we got a nice little wall of jewels from the past. I was a big Hosoi fan when I was a kid, so of course I gotta have a little Hosoi board up there too. I started skating because um, I was reading um, Donald Duck cartoons and I saw the three nephews of Donald riding a skateboard down the hill and it looked like fun so I got my mom to, to buy me one also. Yeah. So maybe we go to Wilhelmsburg first. Wilhelmsburg. What is that? That's a beautiful, very old Hamburg traditional spot. Looks like waves made out of tiles. So where are we? Wilhelmsburg. It's this little part of Hamburg called. And uh, it's a school and they have this really amazing spot here. You gotta go check it out. It's like this brick quarter pipes, natural quarter pipes. I learned my first drop in. <laughs> the architect that designed it was a surfer, so I guess he was really wave inspired. Because of the weather situation here in Germany, a lot of skating evolves around skate parks in the winter time. So um, we had one of the better skate parks here in Hamburg, so a lot of people came here. There was also like a four-on-one checkout where we got some tricks in it too. Jan Wage, he was ripping at that time. And then a little bit later, Markus Jürgensen and Fabio Fusco and Patrick Ehling. Yeah. And he's still around. What up, Ehling? <laughs> nice. What's the name of the school? Uh, just, we just call it Hardboard Wobbles. Wobble, like wobbles. Because it's wobble. Has this been wobble and.
we're in the red light district, one of the most famous ones in whole Europe. Naked women everywhere, sex shows, up and down the whole street. So yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Come along. Lucia Luce, sick ass sausage spot. What a big ass queue there, man. What's going on? Is the sausages for free today or what? Well, let's go check it out. Mouth's all watery already. Check them out. All kinds. White ones, red ones, thick ones, thin ones. You guys want any as well? Sausage? Eine Currywurst und ein Bier bitte. Aber möchten Sie nichts sagen? And you know when it even tastes better? When you are hungover and then you're on your way home. Before you go home, have one last one. Nightlife, Hamburg. Better than McDonald's, way better. Yeah, it was an amazing day, amazing night in Hamburg city. So, whenever you get to Germany, make sure you come check it out. It's a really fun city, lots of stuff to discover, a lot of stuff to do, and uh, yeah, come see for yourselves. Check it out. Berlin ist eine sehr aufregende Stadt, die haben viele perfekte Spots, coole Leute da. Die Stadt selbst ist Hammer. Ähm, Wien hat schon ziemlich gute Spots, aber da ich da jetzt schon seit acht Jahren geht, wird das langweilig irgendwann. Und Berlin ist einfach, es gibt so viele perfekte Spots. For Germany, it's really a unique skateboard scene. Not only for skateboarding, but a lot of young people move here. That's what makes it attractive. Ja, wir haben gestern den Michi Markhardt und den Jan Kliever getroffen. Das sind zwei sehr bekannte Pros. Oh mein Gott! skate scene in Berlin is actually, it's booming, it's blasting, you could say. I mean, all those kids come from all over the country to skate the park. You can see the wide acceptance of the skate park, especially for the young kids, like they come to do clinics, they come to do the workshops. We do them now actually every morning and uh, there's like 20, 30 kids that they want to learn to skate and they don't have even the basics, so it's, it's quite a good sign. This whole neighborhood is quite freaky. It's known like it's called Friedrichshain, but we call it Friedrichshain because there's a lot of freaky people living there. Hardcore people that are into hardcore music, tattooed, anything that's sort of like extreme in a way. It's kind of cool. That gives it a, a nice, um, a nice feel. I grew up skating street, and I had to because there was nothing. There was not even a, an indoor park at the time, and um, we skated. We basically skated in subway tunnels in the winter time, like just gloves, beanies and like, there you go. <laughs> that, that was what we had then. Berlin had quite some talent, like Sammy Harithi and guys like him, they were actually known like throughout the country and maybe even throughout the world. The vert ramp was actually my idea. The actual first plans didn't involve a vert ramp and uh, I sort of came up with the idea of building the street course around it so we can still have like all the room behind the vert ramp that we didn't need for decks for like the street skaters and have a big enough street course to have international comps on. Yeah, so I just went through the planning all over again and, and just did all the drawings and I built it myself. 
have something that's made from cement. We were actually interested in the way of working with cement goes and uh, that's how we came up with this little project. We actually were building one quarter pipe that was like two feet tall at the beginning and uh, just added bits and pieces to it and then we just realized, hey, it's totally doable. We can, we can build a little cement mini ramp. Well, it's not properly a mini ramp, but it's more like a vert ramp that's three, four foot tall, but it's a really fun place to skate. It just turned out to be like one of my favorite spots in the world, because I skate this all the time normally when I'm outside and I just love it. It's challenging. It felt great actually to open the place up and be like, hey, what do you think of this? Look what we've built. Getting the first reactions of, of people that liked it, they were actually into it. It was amazing, like especially when someone like Busnitz in, in springtime said, hey, this is one of the most creative parks I've skated. And you get these sort of reactions, it's just amazing. It's, it's like once you made your dream come true and someone tells you that it was a good dream you, you were dreaming and the outcome is great, that it's one of the best things that can happen to you, I think. You know, you always get the people that are sort of talking bad on skate parks, but on the other hand, myself, I always skated everything. And I've, like, I grew up skating street, parks, vert, bowls, everything. It's all been interesting to me. It all made my skating grow in, in, in total as a, as a general thing. I never said, oh, I'm a vert skater, even though that's what I do for a living. I've always tried to maintain all the types of skating and, and make them become one thing in the end. I was born in Gütersloh, which is pretty much the belly button of Germany. Small town, 80,000 inhabitants. People laugh about this, but I never saw a skateboard before I built my first skateboard. Uh, my cousin and I were just joking around with a bunch of stuff. We had built a, what was supposed to be an aeroplane that we wanted to fly down this little hill with <laughs> and totally crashed. And we had like this week of just total chaos and ideas and things. And we found an old roller skate, like really old style roller skate in the, in the yard. And we put, we taped, duct taped uh, a piece of wood on top of it, sat down, rolled down the hill, thought it was funny, tried standing up, fell. The thing came apart. We took the two pieces and built like what looked like a self-made skateboard at the time. Just kept doing this for a week or two. And then on television, there was a little something about on skateboarding. A German team called the Banzai team. I guess Banzai was an American company. And they had like a German team or something. And they were on a sports program. We saw it, couldn't believe it because we'd done this for two weeks now. And then there they are. You know, 76, you go figure. It's just 360, some handstands and that kind of stuff. And then we kind of just kept doing it, you know, every day, total craziness. But I never actually saw a board before I first stepped on one. Never saw anyone skate. Much, much later, saw the first real made skateboard in the shop. Stole 80 Deutsche Marks at the time. That's like $40 or something from my mom's purse and bought it. She wasn't mad. She, she wasn't around. We wanted it. We wanted it now. We couldn't wait. Ah, let's go grab the money. And my brother and I bought a board. And, we obviously just got better, liked what we were doing in a town next to my town, a slightly bigger town called Bielefeld. They had a skateboard team and a club, and they had a contest in 77, which we went to thinking we wouldn't win anything, but I won everything. Got sponsored by this uh, aluminum board company. They were called Calypso, German company, yeah. and they made aluminum double kick boards. We started entering competitions like German championships, European championships in freestyle, high jump, and slalom, just like everyone else did at the time. And at some point, my dad saw these British soldiers' kids, because uh, obviously we, uh, we were, were occupied by British soldiers where I live, and we've got a, the second largest military airport in all of Europe, in my hometown. So the British kids had caught on to skateboarding, I think, a year earlier than the German kids. So they had magazines, and, and, and there was contact to shops in England and stuff like that. Through them, really, we all of a sudden, we went to England, we visited skate parks, we, we had contact with uh, a skate shop called Surrey Skateboards. We kind of were in contact with one of the salespersons there, and he kept us uh, 
updated on what's going on. And at some point, we met Shogo Kubo in, in England in the Rolling Thunder Skate Park. And just seeing him skate, we just went crazy. We built a half pipe at home and just went off. My mom was flicking through the newspaper and she was saying, oh, in the city about a half hour away from here called Hum, there's going to be an, an American team is having a half pipe show. And we had just kind of finished our half pipe and thinking, wow, American team, you know, who's it going to be? Great, let's go, let's watch this, you know. We arrived and it's this humongous half pipe without flat bottom with a big Tita's logo on it, like a blue, uh, very shaky half pipe. And some people were skating it about halfway up, kick turning. I saw this one dude with like this long beard. So I said, um, my mom said that this American team is going to show up and do a show here, you know. Uh, when are they going to arrive? And he was giving me this attitude, you know, like, dude, you know, don't tell me, you know, if this is the team, don't tell me you can do better. So I said, yeah, we can. We got our boards with us, you know, can we skate? And he's like, yeah. You know, like totally challenging us, challenging us, saying, yeah, let's go. So we dropped in. People just went nuts because they watched them kick turn halfway up all day. We climbed up to the top, dropped in, did rock and rolls and frontside airs and stuff. We obviously became members of the team. They, you know, they're kind of like, uh, oops, <laughs> can you skate for us? It was not about the, the show part of it. It was more like skating a different half pipe once in a while. But that, the guy obviously I talked to was Titus. You know, which I didn't know at the time, you know. <laughs> he just had a very weird beard in the beginning. Till about 84, I never thought this was going to be something I could earn money with or anything. It was always just about skateboarding. You can't really explain what's so fun about it, but something really drives you to just keep doing it. And I think it's an international thing. Everyone knows. I mean, if you're a true skateboarder, you will know why the hell you're on this thing. And that's all I cared about. But obviously, you try to make contacts, and so Titus made a board with my name on it. And I, I thought it was kind of cool, you know. Obviously, you know, someone says, let's, let's make this board. And I thought up the, the whole clock idea and everything, and, and, which I kept through all my boards pretty much. But in 84, I got uh, picked up by, well, Powell and independent trucks. And they, they sent me to the States in 85 for the first time. So, and then this is the first real big craze. Pros having to sign autographs for an hour. People loving it, MTV catching on to it. That's when I kind of thought, oh, all right. So I could be in this for longer now. Did you have the deal with Santa Cruz worked out before you quit Powell? Or did you just quit Powell? Oh, no, no, I quit. I just quit Powell. You know, I just quit Powell. And it was easy at the time to do that. Thinking back now, it's like, wow, this is a pretty bold move. You know, it's a major company interested in you, wanting to bring out a board. And Stacy just wasn't catching on to it, giving me all sorts of advice, coming across like a dad too much, and I didn't really want another dad. I had one already, who was kind of pissing me off at times. So I just told him on the phone, I said, look, fuck it. You know, the board's not what I want it to be, and communication's not good, and I know that you're a big deal, and I could get some place, but I'll, fuck it. I had no plan B, so to speak. I skated the Vancouver uh, uh, World Championship, got sixth place in halfpipe and, and bowl, and that's when I got my offer for Santa Cruz. I was on Santa Cruz when Santa Cruz was having their heyday. They were a super supportive company. Biggest career move, so to speak, I ever made. These were the best days, best years of my life. I moved out for a couple of months, a year or something like that. Lived in Santa Cruz up 44th Street, up on a supermarket with, you know, you know, the skateboarders at the time. You know, Jason Jesse was there, and Husoy would stay once in a while. And then pretty much every employee of Santa Cruz Skateboards lived up there. Um, but I never officially moved out of my house. When, you know, there were certain times when I stayed in the States longer, or when I stayed in Berlin for, a, you know, a longer time or something like that. But I still live at a, in that house. You know, it's my house now. It was my parents' house, and now it's my house. If you look at it now, and how everyone's traveling internationally, it's kind of hard to see why back in the days it was so important to go to the States. Because I think that the companies really wanted you to go over and prove yourself there, whereas now they're sending everyone and their mother over to Europe to, to find great skate spots and look good. Back then, you really had to go over it. The last, I'd say, five years, for some strange reason, it feels like I'm really feeling the benefit of what I've done before. 
back in the day when you were one of the top guys, it's pretty hectic. You have to plan your day differently and you have to kind of prove yourself. And I don't have to do that anymore. I can kind of look back at what the little kid from Goodislow has achieved and it's, it's pretty crazy to look back and, and think that I've done all these things and it, it's relaxing, it's very relaxing. When you go to bed, it's kind of, it eases your mind a lot, you know. You think back to think, I had this goal to achieve that and I actually did, which is crazy. And I excelled, you know, I even got a lot more out of it than I thought. I've always loved it, you know, and I really admire some of the new guys out there for doing what they did. Because, I mean, technically, it is light years away from what we were doing. Fucking little bonus one on the top of a half pipe. It's easy compared to some of the stuff that they're doing. So they really took it to a v completely different level. I really saw skateboarding from kick turns to what it is now, and I, nothing can surprise me. Some guy will come up with something completely new tomorrow. I saw Rodney doing ollies in Sweden in the summer camp, not knowing the potential of what he was doing. And the same summer camp I saw Mike McGill doing the McTwist, which seemed pretty incredible, but it's not like I was surprised by it, like overwhelmingly, you know. It's more like, oh yeah, skateboarding, there you go. start off with introducing my team riders from Trap. <laughs> he's been on the team for like six years now and he's like stoked. <laughs> he goes a little bit faster, likes like bullish kind of stuff more. Not really that much of a street skater but like bulls, vert. Here we got little... He's also more into like bowl skating and... But he skates street pretty good too. Nolly inward 360 heel flip he just made last week. This is like our eight Asian kind of tech dog. He's like all over curbs and stuff. Sometimes he slides with his body and sometimes with the boards. He's, he's just like for downhill, you know? He takes like downhill stuff. He gets really gnarly. He goes like 110 standing up. He likes to eat like female skaters too. So he gets into trouble from time to time. 